for his opportunity sharing with us today. We're in the book of Hosea, so if you're a guest with us, we're diving right in. Uh, we're the second week of a series on the book of Hosea. If you open up your Bible, it might fall open to Isaiah, and so you'll turn right, go a few blocks down, you'll come to this minor prophet named Hosea. Had some great conversations this week. People were like, I never, never heard of this. I never knew this book was in there. How did I miss this? And so we're going to continue to go. There's a lot more where that came from last week. So the book of Hosea. Last week, just a big recap. If you missed last week, you can go online and watch the whole thing. But just a quick summary. A prophet has three roles. Proclaim, predict, demonstrate. Very similar to Benny, right? a, a rabbi. But Hosea is a, a prophet. And so the very first thing God asks Hosea to do is to demonstrate. I'm going to ask you to demonstrate your, your life. And so Hosea is called to go marry a woman of whoredom. Yes, you heard that correctly. Go marry a prostitute. Go marry an adulterous woman. So that was last week's message. And so he does that. And so that's where we find ourselves today. Hosea chapter 1. And you can grab a Bible, follow along. You can actually take a Bible. We have them in the back if you don't have your own copy. So verse 3. So last week talked about this marriage. This week in my small group, we were kicking around this idea of even sharing your wedding vows, right? For us, it's 20 minutes. A wedding nowadays is about 20 minutes. In Jewish custom at that time, it was a week. A week-long party. Put yourself in his shoes. The vows that he says to his wife, who he knows is unfaithful. Her vows back to him. So you know she's going to be un unfaithful. Either she had already been unfaithful or she's, she's going to be unfaithful. And yet he says he's obedient to what God's asked him to do, to be her husband. Why? Just to recap, nation of Israel is playing the adulterous woman. And we all look at this story and we're like, wow. Maybe God's called me to be Hosea. No, God's not called you to be Hosea. Hosea is playing the role of God in this story. We play the role of Gomer. Just to clarify for everyone in the room, what's your part of this story? We're the unfaithful spouse in this story. Every one of us, we play the unfaithful spouse. So then we come to, to verse 3. So he went. He did what God asked him to do. He took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, they're going to have three children. Hosea and this unfaithful woman are going to have three children, two boys and a girl. It's going to go boy, girl, boy. Now, the first child, it says specifically in the text that she bore him a child. It doesn't say that the next two children. So either, this, either he's the parent of this first son and the other two are not. Right, but, but we're deducting from the text. It's very clear. The first child says she bore him. But we, don't, we don't know for sure. What we do know is his wife was unfaithful. Uh, they have their firstborn child. Now, they didn't do paternity tests back then. Uh, they didn't go on Jerry Springer to find out who's, who's the daddy. Who's the daddy of this, of this firstborn son. But we can deduct from the text. Good chance it wasn't his son, okay? So... The, Another thing they have today that they didn't have back then is gender reveal parties. That's like that a thing now. It's like a big deal. You invite people over and, you know, you have to put it on social media. They didn't have that when, when my wife and I had our three children, gender reveals party. Uh, but first child, God says, Jose, I know you, you and Gomer have some names picked out, but I got this. Lay your names aside. I'm going to name the children. Now, when we... Each time my wife was pregnant, I had a boy name ready to go. I had several boy names ready to go. I have three daughters. So I never got to use those boy names. Maybe my daughters, I'm going to give pass those names on to them if they have sons. Right? I'm just going to, here, here's, some, here's some ideas for you. Well, maybe Jose and Gomer had some names picked out. They were, hey, here's the name. Some of you have been there. You're like, you're in labor. And at the same time, you're like, I got to come up with a name. We can't, we can't. Give birth to this child without a name, right? God says, I've got this. I'm going to give you the name that you're going to name this first 
this first boy. And they're like, okay, all right, we'll give, the, we'll give up that right. Hosea's given up a lot of rights already at this point. So he's like, what's, what's one more step here? So give me the name. And so he's like, okay, here's the name. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. And I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. What's his name? Judgment. Translate judgment. Punishment. Another scatter. I'm going to scatter the nation of Israel. So, I mean, this poor kid, his entire life. Had to walk around. His name was Judgment, right? Class roster, first day of school. Teachers given going through the list of names. Amy, present. Adam, present. Becca, present. Judgment. What a cute little boy. <laughs> what a nice little boy. His name is Judgment. What is God doing? Right? Hosea's family was more prominent than you or I. He was well known. People knew his family. They saw his family. Every time his name was called, Hosea, son, judgment, was a reminder to the nation of Israel what God is going to do. God is going to bring judgment upon the nation of Israel. Why? I don't have time to go into all the details. A little homework this week. Dive into your Bible. 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10 gives you historical context while God's going to bring judgment to to Israel. It's an R-rated movie. Just a heads up. He's going to destroy the dynasty of Jehu, who was a king. Why? Because he slaughtered all of Ahab's sons, 70 sons, not just killed them, but beheaded them, placed those heads in the valley of Jezreel. The valley of Jezreel. It's a valley. It's also a town. If you go to there today, it's a beautiful valley, green valley, very fertile. But it was a symbol of war. It was a symbol of bloodshed. Maybe you've heard of this woman. Her name's Jezebel, right? It's where she died. She was pushed out of a second-story window. She dies, and it was prophesied that she wouldn't even be buried, but the dogs would come and lick up her body. R-rated movie, right? It's in there. Other words, when people heard Jezreel, it wasn't good. Bloodshed and war. I'm going to do to you as you have treated others. As what you have done, what I have given you, I'm going to bring judgment upon the house and the nation of Israel. Judgment. It's also a land or a valley that many believe is where the future battle will take place. It's the Battle of Armageddon. Maybe you've heard of that. Uh, Megiddo, Valley of Megiddo. It's also the Valley of Jezreel. Judgment. I'm going to talk to you just for a moment about judgment. Why? Because it's in the text. You can't skip over it. Parents, you have children in the room. You don't bring judgment upon your kids. At least I hope you don't. Judgment is once and for all. It's eternal. It's permanent. Judgment uh, is looking at the sin, the pun- what, what was done, and then acting an equal consequence to that. Right? Followers of Jesus in the room. God does not judge you. He judged his son. And because of that, he looks at you and declares you good and right. So he doesn't judge you. Right? That's good news. For followers of Jesus in the room, that's good news. It's a somber conversation, but it's one that's in the text, so I need to have it with you. Jesus speaks more about this doctrine of hell than he does about heaven. But he does so kindly, and he does so gently. It's a doctrine I don't even have words to explain to you, really, how bad it is. The words I have would not do justice. It's a place that there's nothing pleasurable, there's nothing good. It is... There's no grace, there's no kindness, there's no love, and most importantly, it's the absence of God for eternity. I can't explain that to you other than it's God saying to an individual who says their entire life, I'm good. I have no need of God in my life. I'll figure it out. I'm my own God. I'll take care of that myself. 
It's God finally giving people the desires of their heart for the very last time. Eternal separation from God is when God says, at the end of their life, you chose to live your entire life apart from me. I now will grant you that wish for all of eternity. It's not in a message entirely on the doctrine of hell, but it is a doctrine that's clearly taught in Scripture. The judgment of God upon those who live their life apart from the salvation that Jesus offers. And why do we talk about this? Hundreds of years ago, when our nation was just forming, there were some revivals that broke out. Revivals like the Great Awakening. There were two rounds of the Great Awakening. And a lot of times, the sermons centered around the doctrine of hell. Now, we look at that and are like, oh my goodness. There was a man named Jonathan Edwards who on July 8th, 1741, he preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he preached this sermon. He didn't even finish it. Because there was so much wailing and grieving and people falling over, recognizing the sin, the heaviness of their sin, and the weight of grace. Grace is so much greater when we understand our sin. Listen, the good news is better when we understand how bad the bad news is. We can't skip over the bad news. The bad news, it's bad. It's really, really, really bad. But because of that, it makes the good news even better. So the good news is, through the grace that Jesus offers each one of us, he does not judge us, he does not condemn us. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is good news, my friends. It's even better news when we really understand how bad the bad news is. What I have earned in my life, what I have earned, is eternal separation from God. Through Jesus, what has been given to me is grace. And when we look at the story of Hosea, my friends, it was God's love that came first. It was not the repentant woman's heart that came first. It was God's love that came first. Choose to love her in her unfaithfulness. Despite her fact that she is chasing other men night after night after night, I think Hosea did a lot of single dad parenting while she was out. Hosea was raising these kids, knowing full well where his wife was. God's love pursues us in our unfaithfulness. That is good news. Religion says, you change your behavior, now you get God's love. Many people think that. Many people live their life like that. If, I, if I'm good enough, God loves me. If I change this action, something I did this week with bad behavior... God's not going to love me as much as next week when I try harder and now I'm a better person. That, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says God loves you and God's love changes us. Right? God's love, when I fully comprehend and understand God's unconditional love for my life, that brings about change in my life. God's love comes first. Hosea's love to his wife came first pursues her with, with, a, with abandon in this passage. Jezreel. <clears throat> Jezreel. Now, the judgment's coming upon the northern kingdom, which is Israel. The southern kingdom is Judah. The northern kingdom gets judgment. Southern kingdom, God spares them for a little while. You can read that. That's also in the book of Kings. There's a lot of good stuff in the book of First and Second Kings. One angel wipes out 185,000 people, spares the southern kingdom of, of Judah. So that's the first child. Great baby names, huh? Today's sermon title is Choosing Baby Names. Verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And they're probably like, can we please name this child? And the Lord said to him, call her name No Mercy, for I will have no more, I will have more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by how? By bow or by sword or by war or by the horses or by horsemen. All right, so second child, no mercy. 
No mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is not getting any kids in the room who play mercy with your friend. You grab hands and you probably shouldn't be sharing this. This is what I did as a kid. You grab their fingers and you pull them back. It's a really fun game to play underwater. And and you, you bend their fingers back until they say, mercy, and you let go, right? But mercy, when God gives us mercy, he's saying, I'm not going to give you what you do deserve. You do deserve judgment. Mercy is, I'm not going to give you that judgment. I'm going to withhold my judgment. Grace is the opposite. I'm going to give you something you don't deserve. I'm going to give you goodness and favor and kindness. So mercy and grace go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. But God says, you're going to live as a nation as if I don't exist. Name your second child no mercy. So again, every time that daughter was called, no mercy. Mercy is a beautiful name. Uh, and I know some people named Mercy. That's a beautiful name. No mercy. I've never heard of anybody named No Mercy. You'd have to question that family and the parenting going on in that home. No mercy, right? Lo Ruama. Ruama, Jewish name, beautiful name. Ruama, mercy. Lo Ruama, no mercy. Name your second child. I want the nation of Israel to be reminded that they've chosen to live as a nation apart from me. But I will have no mercy when judgment, when the Assyrians come in and bring destruction and scatter the nation. No mercy. Great names. Those are the two. A son and a daughter. When she had weaned no mercy, this is verse 9, she conceived and bore a son. Again, I don't think these are his children. He's raising another man's son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people, for you are not my people, I am not your God. Judgment, no mercy, not my people. Beautiful family photo. Imagine that on the Christmas card. Here's my three kids. Judgment. This is what Hosea lived on a day-to-day basis. I believe he was mocked. I believe there were gossip chains and rumors, and can you believe what he's doing? Why is he still with her? Does he know who she is? What is Hosea doing? He's being faithful to what God's called him to do. Hosea, in my opinion, is a type of Christ. A type in Scripture means someone who's representing a picture of Jesus. He is not Jesus by any stretch of the imagination, but, the, but by his example, he's pointing to, he's pointing to Jesus who last week we talked about, is the perfect husband. Jesus is the perfect husband. And for all of us in the room to understand that Jesus, church, is our husband. Call his name not my people, for you are not my people. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the war. Now here's verse 10. I don't know what translation you have, the one you're looking at, but prepositions, propositions change everything. A statement is made in Scripture, and then he f- follows with a but. Or in this case, it's a yet. It's a yet. God says, although I'm going to scatter you, I'm also going to bless you and multiply. So if you're taking notes, multiplication. God, what is God going to do to the nation of Israel? He's going to multiply. Now, here at Boulder Mountain, we believe that God is not done with the nation of Israel. There are promises and covenants that God is going to fulfill one day to the nation of Israel. It's an important, it's important part of his plan. At the same time, he has grafted Gentiles into salvation through the person of Jesus. Yet the number of children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Verse 1 of chapter 2, say to your brothers, you are my people, yet changes everything. And to your sisters, you have received mercy. Now for us here today, the gospel is, despite the fact we deserve judgment, despite the fact we do not deserve mercy, despite the fact that we have lived as though we are not God's people, God says, but yet I will pursue you. Through the person of Jesus, I am providing salvation for you. I'm providing mercy for you. And 
throughout the New Testament, we see different writers pick up this, this language. And, and Peter, we see Peter talking about, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In the marriage of Hosea, it's a warning, it's, it's a picture of God's ultimate unconditional faithful love to the people of Israel. In the demonstration of the children, it's a warning and a caution. And that same caution is for all of us here today. For followers of Jesus and for those who've not placed their faith in Jesus, there's a caution. Maybe you can relate to what I'm going to share with you. There's been times in my life where I'm like, I'm, I'm going to figure this out on my own. I know this is what God says, but I think if I do it this way, I think it's going to be better for me. I know what God says, but I'm going to make this decision and this decision and this decision on my own apart from God. And then when something goes bad, I turn to God and say, God, why did you do that to me? Anybody else relate? When we choose to live apart from what God has, it's not good. Now I want to talk to you about discipline. Talked about judgment, we talked about discipline. If you're a follower of Jesus here in the room today, God will discipline you. And for that, we should be grateful. If something bad happens in your life, it does not mean you've done something bad. What discipline is, discipline is temporal. Discipline is all about reconciling the relationship. Parents in the room, if you've disciplined your kids, it's not to condemn them for eternity. Some of the kids in the room are like, oh yeah. You should, you should know what they've said to me. It's to strengthen the relationship, right? It's not, it's not past tense, it's future tense. You're going to discipline. God disciplines those who, if you're being disciplined by God, take heart because God loves you. In Hebrews 12, it says, you are illegitimate ch children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they have disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Discipline. God may discipline us in areas of our life where we've made good choices. But what does he want to do? He wants to form us into the image of his son. So there's going to be discipline. Discipline is hard. It's hard. I'd much rather walk out of the gym than walk into the gym knowing what's coming, right? But why do we do, why do, we do those things? Why do we have discipline in our life? Because we know this is what God says to us. And I trust God that he is, what he has for me is so much better than what I have for myself. What God has for the nation of Israel is so much better than what they have for themselves. What God has for Hosea and for Gomer is so much better than what they have. My friend, what God has for you is so much better than what you have for yourself. You may have a plan for your life, and you've been, you've been chasing that plan with or without God. God's plan for you is so much better than anything you or I could ever imagine. But, it, but it's hard. Our friend who just shared on stage, what he shared with me, the challenges of the, having to raise support and the challenges of being in different homes, and the, it's taken a toll on her. It's not easy. This is what God's called them to. What's God called you to? Is there an area of your life? Is there a Jezreel in an area, a uh, part of your life? Is there an area of your life where you said, yeah, I have left God completely out of all my decision making in this area? Under Hosea and our theme for the series, it's return. Repent is another word, return. And God's, God's saying, I want you to come back to me. I, I love you. He desires relationship. And I think every day Hosea woke up, it broke his heart when he thought about his marriage. And it's a picture of what God goes through when we chase after every, everything under the sun. We're chasing after idols, chasing after all these other things. And it breaks his heart. Because he loves you. He loves you. And when we fully understand that and grasp that, his love will change us. 
We don't change to earn his love. His love comes in. We receive it. And the story is not over, my friends. We're going to continue on this the story of what God asks Hosea to do and Gomer's life and where she goes and how he asks Hosea to demonstrate God's un, unfaithful, faithful, unconditional love. And so continue to keep coming back as we walk through this story of, of Hosea. Would you pray with me? God, I'm reminded of the passage Paul writes in Romans. While we were sinners, not after we repented, not after we stopped sinning, but God demonstrated his love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, thank you for your unconditional love that pursues us, chases us, even when we're unfaithful. I pray for decisions in this room this morning, for anyone who has never placed their faith and trust in you, that today would be that day. They simply say, I recognize I'm a sinner, and I place my faith and trust that Jesus came and paid the price for my sins on the cross three days later, defeated death. And through the power of the resurrection, we have a glorious hope. I place my faith in Jesus today. I'm asking that he be Lord and Savior of my life. God, for those of us who've already made that decision, if there's areas of our life that we need to simply return to you, I pray that you would make that clear. And you're just calling us to come back to you. To come back. We're always welcome. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that... I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.